please welcome this evening's guest moderator, director of the New York Film Festival, Kent Jones, and tonight's guests, Wes Anderson, Ray Fiennes, and Tony Revolori. Thank you, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I want to start uh, by talking about how this movie came to be in at the end of the film, and I'm sure that most of the people in the room have not seen the film yet, uh, but it's not giving anything away about the movie to say that at the end of the film you say there's a card that says that it's inspired by the writings of the writer Stefan Zweig. And I know that there's another story that inspired the movie, so I thought that that would be a good place to start. Okay, yeah, and another story? Uh, uh, isn't there another story of another of a true story that was be? Uh, well, there's a guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah um. Yeah, yes. The the um the character uh, played by Rafe uh, is called Monsieur Gustav, and um he's um, uh he was originally inspired by a uh, by a, a, a mutual. I wrote the script with my friend Hugo, and it, uh, it, our mutual friend is the model who Ray, who Rafe, in fact, n knows as well for uh, some years. Um, although I will say, it th that was the beginning of the character, and then I had this thought to kind of put it in a context like a Stefan Zweig story. This writer who I had started reading a few years ago, who I who I just fell in love with his. Uh, stories and his memoir and so those things got merged together and then as you and then and then Rafe uh, took over you know and it's so I, in the end I almost feel I'm almost reluctant to say it's, it's it, that the model is uh, our friend but um but he was the first model mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just to for cinephiles out there Stefan Zweig wrote the novella the letter from an unknown woman by Max Ophuls is based on and yeah. Yes, and um, and you know I, the first one I read is a book called Beware of Pity, which is a great his one big novel, his one real novel, um, and um, and I, I love this book, and also his memoir, um, the the world of yesterday, um, is sort of inspired a lot of things in the movie, even though in the end the movie's probably not really l anything like one of his uh, stories. It still draws on a lot of. Uh, things from his work, I guess. And so you said a minute ago, and then I turned it over to Rafe. <laughs> so I wonder how that translates. What does that mean, I, you know, turning it over to you, Rafe? Well, um, I feel it was, it was a collaboration of... Um, Wes had written this fantastic screenplay with many wonderful roles, and uh, Gustav seemed to be sort of pivotal in a way. Uh, uh, a character that on the page one wondered what at what pitch or what the right nuance was, I think. I think we our earliest discussions were where does you pitch it at? Is it high flamboyant and a very demonstrative, or is it perhaps n the other way? And I think a lot of our discussions, and indeed the first few days, were feeling where, well, in a way, where you felt it, it sat, it's, it, it sat best. And uh, I was throwing out different options I think <laughs> well I remember the, 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 I, one moment I remember uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, for me a very exciting moment was we are we you know Rafe w uh, Rafe's character is a hotel concierge and he wears uh, sort of like what you, like a cutaway or what do you, I don't know what you call that a ta it entails um, and um, the costume was being made and we there our costume designer Milena Cananero she works with a large team there's you know like 16 Italians uh, surrounding Rafe with pins uh, stuck in him and, and you really did not like the way this thing was fitting it I, I had picked this thick fabric it, very, it was and it just and it wasn't quite right it, you could sort of see it but your body language was growing darker and darker and less and less like the character and at a certain point you, there, there was a lot of tugging and pulling and, and and finally you said can I can we please have just one moment can we please like I, 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 all the, uh, the 16 people scattered out of the room and you said I don't this doesn't I don't feel good in this and then you said I want to feel like this and you started sort of dancing around like Fred Astaire in the room, and then I thought, well, he can do it in this outfit, but, it, but he doesn't really want to. So then I said, 
whatever Rafe just asked for, or change the thing, make it thinner, do it. I want him to feel like he wants to move like that. Um, but th those often, th those, those, th those are very valuable learning curves in, in costume fittings, because everyone goes in, no one quite knows what, what it should be. And I w it, was, it was about four hours of standing with these things being pinned, heavy, heavy fabric. And I did suddenly feel this exactly what you described. Like it, it should you should be he should be light on his feet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it, and, it, and, it, and it, to me it was fun because I I, I was, I, I both was I felt bad that we were that you, that it wasn't right. And also, I saw you just do it right in front of me, right there. Um, so I felt <laughs> like the, 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 there, there there it is. Yeah. Um, uh, so it was a quite a fun moment. Tony, how did your costume feel? Did it um, it was very light, but it was very tight. I remember <laughs> one of the um, first costume fittings, you know, I'm going in there with Milena and they're putting the pins and everything and I feel all right. And then Wes comes in to check it out and he says, make it tighter <laughs> and walks out the room. That was the only note he had just to make it tighter. And it was great, though. I loved wearing it. It really put me in my character. Yes, Tony's character is called a lobby boy, and it's some kind of uh, page of some sort or bell, sort of bellboy. Um, but you really did, you you know, you're you you're a very well mannered person anyway. But when you put on this costume and just are your when you put on this outfit and are yourself, it's a very kind of reassuring presence. You feel like you have someone who will, you know, deal with whatever is going to come up in a calm. Uh, we'll do your way. best to help you. Yes, that's yeah. that's what this character was. So that's <laughs> what I try to do as much as I possibly could. Um, before, when you were preparing for the movie, Wes, I remember you were looking at uh, older hotel movies, right? Um, mm, yeah, we yes, you know, we ended up with a. Um, I think you even helped uh, us make this list. I mean, I know you helped us make this list of um, of, mo of old of movies to look at, and um, and we, uh, we from a few quarters we got some very good uh, suggestions, and we ended up with um, a, a, a big stack of movies that we all uh, looked, at, looked in, at in in Germany, the uh, early Lubitsch movies and. Um, and um, we had Grand Hotel, and uh, what else did we have? Um, the Mortals. What, what, was what was that early Lubitsch movie about the two thieves? Um, that's that's Trouble, Trouble in Paradise. Paradise. What it? Trouble in Paradise. Yeah, I love that. Trouble in Paradise. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the Herbert Marshall. Herbert Marshall, this English actor that I've never heard of, who speaks very, 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 very fast. Uh, uh, and and uh, I thought, who is this guy? He speaks so fast. It's amazing. And I Googled him. I Googled him. Uh, 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 and he, he had lost a leg in the First World War, yes. but you wouldn't know it from the film. And there were these shots. I watched the film first, and he runs up <laughs> these stairs all very, the way fast. All the way down, up and down, all the way up, Clearly all the way it was, down. it was yeah. obviously a double, but I hadn't, it was very funny. And I went back and watched the film again, and he, they shoot him from the waist up all the time. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, you also told me there is a scene in the film that's absolutely inspired by a scene from Torn Curtain by Alfred Hitchcock. Mm. Do you not want to talk about that? Well, I try not to. I try not. To. This is one of those things where, where we could. Do, some things are inspired, and you know, some things uh, are plagiarism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a little too uh, close to the plagiarism. But um, but you know, I was. I feel we made it our own. But that's what plagiarists do. You know, <laughs> to some degree. I mean. Uh, well, the reason I bring it up is because it's a film that has a lot of different uh, layers to it, and there is a, a, a suspense layer to it, and obviously there's a comic layer to it, and then many others as well. Yes, well, you know, we we talk, we talk, we, talk, we as we were mentioning the, these Lubitsch movies and and things in that vein, and um, but the uh, the Hitchcock '30s, especially the earlier Hitchcock, the '30s Hitchcock movies were definitely something. You know, we had several of those in our stack of uh, movies that we shared, and uh, I think there are places where we've sort of tried to do Hitchcock-esque things th other than the ones that is really a Hitchcock scene. 39 yeah. Steps, Lady Vanishes, those films. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And f so for Rafe, for Rafe, for you and Tony, what was it, uh, how did you um, work on your relationship between your characters? Because it's very special in the film, particularly the exchange after you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I didn't, 
I think it was just a connection that was just made instantly. I remember the first time meeting Rafe, uh, I was quite nervous, very nervous actually, and he turns to me in a half-finished costumes with pins all over him, um, and he gives me this great big hug, and immediately I just felt it was, you know, all the fear was gone. And so from then on, it just, I don't know, I think it just connected. Well, At least that's what I felt. <laughs> And now I remember what was really impressive about Tony is that you, he knew his, all his part inside out like four or five weeks before we even were filming, uh, which has really impressed me. I thought I'd better get my homework done. <laughs> uh, and then I think we used, to, we used to just, whenever we were on set or, or, or waiting, we would run our lines all the time. All the time. So we, uh, uh, we just kept bang, just kept ripping the lines, didn't we? Kept, kept going. And yep. then we also did the tongue twisters. You taught me that one. A few that tongue twisters, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that really, really <laughs> long one that I don't even think I can do right now. Can you give it a try? <clears throat> See, I got the teacher here, so I got to do my best. She stood upon the balustrade balcony, inimically mimicking him, hiccuping while amicably welcoming him in. And it's a film that actually has quite a few special effects, and so I would imagine that a lot of the world of the movie as it exists on screen was a, gr a green screen. Not, so Not much. as much no. as you would think. So. It, it was all mm -hmm. really tangible and really there, which I thought was fantastic as an actor to be able to see everything and not just rely on your imagination. I thought it was great to be able to see what you're you know, working with. I mean, I'm trying to think of what we what we did do green screen and um, but we don't you know I mean usually it, it, there are probably times when we probably should be using a green screen and I mean uh, Jeremy would uh, Jeremy is just nodding Jer Jeremy's our producer who who probably said we should use a green screen and I said we don't need it we just go against white and we're going to decorate it with these things and then later somebody has to like you know uh, cut out the hair uh -huh. yeah. um, but um, <laughs> but at least we don't have the green screens on the set and it feels like we're really doing it yeah with, I see Jeremy's laughing now but was, <laughs> was he laughing then <laughs> when you were talking about yeah yeah, the, and 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 yeah, and the snow. I mean, it, it's, it's a very snowy movie, yes. and it was a very snowy place uh, where we uh, filmed it, um, so that we had the luxury of real snow. Yeah, and I get the sense, and really inspired by feelings that you had had driving through Eastern Europe, um, through Germany and Eastern Europe. Yeah, you know, we w before we before we um, a after the script was written, we we were trying to figure out how are we going to make this movie and where are we going to make it, and um. And we traveled around to Hungary and Czech Republic and, um, and all around Germany and a little bit in Austria. And, um, and, a, and a lot of things are in the movie uh, from that sort of research. I mean, it changed the, the story in a way. Without changing the words of the script, we, it, it's, it gave it another layer of what the history is in the architecture. Of 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 those you know behind the Iron Curtain of how the fascism how these grand hotels are um, hidden under uh, these communist era interiors and things like that. So anyway, this is sort of what had been uh, expressed in one way, and our story became more about sort of ideologies and things that are in the that are in the physical uh, design of it. I guess that are expressed visually. Yeah. 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 And in a way, what you're doing is giving a whole, a kind of a, a capsule version of, of um, 20th century history of, of Eastern Europe within this, the framework of this movie. Yeah, well, that would be well, good. Well, I don't want to. That would be okay. good if we did that. I, that. That's the way it felt to me. <laughs> in, in a funny way. Can you talk about the rest of the, the cast, Wes, um, who's not here? Um, yes, we have. Let's see. Who we, we've got, um, we've got, where, where do we, so we have Saoirse Ronan. Tilda. Tilda Swinton. Tilda Swinton plays a, a, an 85-year-old woman. Um, we have Jeff Goldblum. Um, Adrian Brody. Adrian Brody. Adrian Harvey. Harvey, Harvey Keitel. Edward Norton. Edward Norton. We've Jason got. Schwartzman. Jason uh, Schwartzman. Bob Balaban. Bob Balaban. Willem, Willem Dafoe. Willem Dafoe. F. Murray Abraham. Jude Law. Jude Law. Yep. Who else we got? <laughs> Edward Norton. Edward Norton. We, no, we said. We said Edward Somebody Norton. said. Yes. Bill Murray. Bill, Bill Murray. Owen yeah. Wilson. F. Murray Owen Abraham. Wilson. <laughs> yep. right. 
We've got some. We've got a lot of guys on this one. And F. Marie Abraham is your character as an older man. Yes, he is. Which was awesome because <laughs> <laughs> he's F. Murray Abraham, you know. And let's not forget Tom Wilkinson. Tom Wilkinson, not, we've no. got yeah. Well, we've named everybody. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, you yeah. know, there they are. Yeah. Oh what? I oh, Lea Seydoux and Mathieu Almarie. Oh, Mathieu Almarie. We left too. out. We left That's out right. a couple of good ones. Lea Seydoux. Le- I oh, said Lea. I did. You said Lea. Yeah. All right. Okay. And we n- let's say let's say next question. Uh, right. <laughs> we have s- we have some we have clips. We should go to the first a cl- clip. A clip. One thing that I wanted to, that was just on my mind when you mentioned Tilda Swinton's name, if one didn't see her name in the cast list, you would never know that it was her, I must say. Um, that's, that's true of a couple of performances of hers, and in this one, it's just, she's... Yeah, Tilda is great, and, um, I t- you know, Tilda, I, I sort of feel like she's, um, she's a wonderful a- 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 act- actress and also sort of a avant-garde performance artist in some way too um, and I feel like that goes into a uh, part like this I don't know anyway um, also you know we do, we do we 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 try to you know we do these movies kind of economically we sometimes are try, trying to do something kind of big on a smaller budget but to the, the with the makeup the old age makeup you just gotta you just gotta spend the money that's the thing we, 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 we you get the person who does uh, you know who ages Meryl Streep into uh, Margaret Thatcher. He also did Voldemort. Oh, really? Oh, Voldemort. Yeah. Is that oh. right? <laughs> yeah. As I say, the top people. <laughs> <laughs> but there was some CGI there. What's hope with Voldemort? Yeah, but he did yeah. a lot. Of, he did three hours of work every day. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to write off the makeup guy. No. <laughs> Um, did it take, y- you mentioned, Rafe, that you were looking for uh, the rhythm of the character and the kind of cadence that you wanted. How long did it take you to, to find that, to get into the groove of the character after your costume had been fitted properly? <laughs> um, well, I think we did an early reading just when we West came to my home in London and we read through, and I think quite quickly, I mean, it, it, you know, one of the things Wes well, it was sort of obvious, and, and, and Wes underlined it, was a, sort of sp- it was a sort of speed of delivery, a rhythm of, of delivery, which was, which sometimes I would say to Wes, oh, it's too fast, it's too fast, no one can understand what I'm saying. Uh, and he said, no, 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 go faster. <laughs> uh, well, I think, but, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of it was, a lot of what we're talking about is, is, was shared between Tony and, and myself, you know, it was a sort of the ping pong of repartee and uh, and I think a lot of these movies old movies that we've been talking about are really helpful because you only have to look at half an hour of one of these Billy Wilder or Ernst Lubitsch movies comic movies from the 30s and you see it's brilliant to watch the skill of say J- um, J- Jimmy Stewart in the shop around the corner um, because what they do is they have a style that you would never call naturalistic but but it it has a realism to it uh, and that's what I think we were aspiring to yeah, so there's an overall rhythm that's stylized, and yet within that, there's an yeah, emotional truth. But I think truth. it was all about keeping it real. I mean, I think, it, you know, I mean, uh, you want to feel you're playing a human being, but the, uh, you know, I can't, I can't really explain it really, but you're not. Yeah, I mean, um, I would say, you, the only thing I would even say, when you say the rhythm is tied, I mean, it's really fast, but all, I mean, they just try to make it real, and, it, and, um, and, and I feel like they do, they make it seem like it's really happening. Do you, I, I, mean, su- I suppose it, what I'm saying is it's not, it can't be unconnected from ha- having a relationship and being, feeling real things. It, you, I mean, I think our, our job was to sort of, there's this sort of technical requirement of what we're calling speed or pace or rhythm, whatever, but... But I think we we still had to have a real human. It's all generated by the, yeah. the exchange. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The yeah. emotion still has to be there. Yep. Why don't we do the next brief clip? Okay. Um, there is a lot of information packed in the film, and it is a very rich experience, and a lot of emotion packed in the film. And I'm wondering, Wes, if you think about for the viewer, um, the idea that they're going of the viewer as someone who's going to go back more than once. 
Well, I mean, I ideally, of course. That, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, uh, I. You know what? I, I, I guess the thing is, you think. Yeah, I, I, my, my experience is, you think about the viewer as, are people going to understand what we're trying to uh, get them to understand here? Are, are, are we keeping the tension during this? Part? It's the, the, You think of the audience I, a lot. I think when you're in the cutting room. But you definitely don't uh, think about w what they'll f notice on the second viewing. You're hoping for the first. But hoping that they'll be drawn to it so that they'll yeah. you know, r have a richer, an increasingly richer experience on the yeah. second, yeah. That's, that's, that's the, the jackpot, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe we wanna do questions from the audience? Hello, um, my name is Kat, I'm a student at NYU, and I have a, cl uh, a class. A question for Ra uh, Rafe and Tony. Um, so, first of all, um, I know that a lot of the dialogue and a lot of Wes Anderson films, uh, uh, it's very, like, quick um, and very, uh, I feel very intelligent and very um, sort of clever. And how did you prepare for, like, that interaction between each other, like, the quick dialogue, the sort of, like, point blank, like, dialogue? Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> we just practiced. Yeah. Just the way to go. Practice, 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 practice. <laughs> Plus another yeah, practice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much for coming to this very cold New York. Thank you. By the way, thank you so much for keep making a very weird, dark, strange, and colorful, funny, wonderful movies. I love it. I love it. Then you are a good looking guy. Why are you are not in the movie? This is this is yeah. the guy. <laughs> Thank Dave? you. No, Dave. Actually, I, I remember uh, you worked with Philip Sima Hoffman in Red Dragon. He was great actor like you. How was work with him? Because I like him. He, I miss him too. So uh, you know that's my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I had the privilege of working with Philip Sima Hoffman in uh, Red Dragon, um, a Hannibal Lecter film. <laughs> Uh, uh, and I remember just how profoundly uh, engaged, in, involved, he, he was in his character all, all the time. He played a, a, a journalist, a tabloid journalist, um, who meets the sticky end at my hands. Um, but, but he was brilliantly, he was very, 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 he was completely there for his, for his acting partner. Very generous, very, 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 very concentrated. Um, and just really professional, 100% there. Just a memory that I, I, I will now treasure. Uh, Wes, your films are as visually striking as they are orally, like from explosions to like the sounds of underwater to the soundtracks that you guys pick. And my question is, what can you tell us about the process that goes into each sort of film, especially this one, about how you select the music and the sort of sound to go with the visual, because that must be a very important quality. Yes, interesting. Thank you. Um, the, um, um, it's just, so, well, you know, this one we had a, we had a thought that maybe, um, well, that, that we wanted to make our own little um, Eastern European country. So we, um, we, uh, made a kind of pastiche of different, uh, so, you know, our, our composer is Alexandre Desplat, who's French, um, but we, we thought we would use, a, 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 instead of a, a string section, we would have a balalaika orchestra that are those, you know, triangular uh, Russian, uh, you know, um, uh, string instrument, and a large number of those make this sort of humming sound, very kind of beautiful, magical sound. And we used alpen horns, those things that they blow to, from one mountain to another. To the, they used to communicate that way. Um, does this ring a bell? This type of thing. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah. And so that was, you know, musically, it, it was a it, it, he Alexand was using those uh, sounds. And then sound-wise, beyond that, the only, you know the it's a slow pr process of trying to make a kind of atmosphere and feeling that's not really particularly something you plan in the beginning. In the, begin the one thing I will say, we, we, we usually 
try to we don't like to loop anything you know i mean it's all the way they said it so you know there's we do we edit the sound but we try to edit it with things that are just from the set so to me this the the dialogue is is really needs wants to be kind of a documentary recording of these performances that we can edit but try not to be put in the position of having to redo it someplace else for some technical reason do you ever have to do that we don't. We don't usually. I mean, we don't really do it. No, I we, can't. Yeah, we we I, we we avoid it pretty well. Uh, this question is directed for Rafe. Uh, so you seem like a good guy. Don't really know you, but a lot of your body of work is uh, being a villain. So my question is, what's more fun and more fulfilling, uh, being protagonist or being an antagonist? Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had in playing villains. Um, fun? Is that fun? Sometimes it's a bit intense. Uh, no, often, I mean, it's a cliche, I suppose, you know, the, uh, um, the devil has all the best tunes. Uh, sometimes that's the case. Um, no, I mean, I've, I've, I, I, you know, I guess um, All villains are different. So, uh, a, a part that was, you know, I mean, uh, the, the SS officer in Schindler's List is a very brilliantly written role by Stephen Zalian with a lot of kind of psychological detail that was really something to get your teeth into. And uh, so that was, and then Voldemort, uh, everyone always brings it up. Um, but that was, that was n uh, not a lot of psychological detail, a lot of wand, a wand action <laughs> and, and, and robe action. Uh, and I had to learn how to. I had a problem with tights underneath my robe because the gusset of the tights would always work its way down between my knees. So the, the, the thing I learned, the most valuable thing I learned was if you have a problem with a gusset in your tights is to, is to cut them off and make garters. And uh, uh, so each, each villain has a different challenge. <laughs> What, 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 what is a gus, gusset, gusset? A gusset is the little, uh, little square of material that sits right here um, against your perineum. <laughs> ah, yeah. If it stays there, of course, if it drops down, it's no longer against your perineum. Hey, uh, this is a question directed for Mr. Anderson. Uh, so I have a question of each, each year films seem like they're, they start off small and then become like way bigger than life and each year casts become bigger with each film it seems like too. As a writer and a director, how do you deal with that many characters within a film and actually keep track of where they're, where they're going to end up by the end of the film? Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Th this movie does have a very big cast. You know, it, it, it takes place in a it's a few different time periods. It, 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 it sort of works its way back to where the story really happens. Um, and it's, it's the, you know, it's a kind of, it, we're accumulating a lot of characters and players as we do that. And, um, and in fact, I, you know, I sort of learned this uh, along the way. There's, you have to be very careful about how you, uh, commu you know, pe people kind of, you, I mean, we all know this watching movies. Some of you, uh, at the end of the movie, you don't know the names of anybody or, you know, you're sort of, sort of uh, was that guy the sister? Or, I mean, was, that the, was she the sister or was she the mother? Or what? You know, you, you, the relationships are not, they don't necessarily just reveal themselves. Um, and, um, and with this movie, even in, in, in post-production, we did a number of little things to kind of underline who is who and, 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 and what their role is. Um, you know, we were kind of working on clarity all the way up until the uh, end of it. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess the answer is you have to try really hard sometimes. Um, but um, uh, yes, um, it's uh, not necessarily a, you know, an automatic thing. Hi, over here, sorry. <laughs> I know, the riots and the glare, hi. So I have a couple questions actually. I wanna first say thank you to Wes for even making these movies. I don't know if anyone else here feels the way I do, but my sense of humor, and <laughs> like you. my expectations of cinema have been pretty much defined by everything you've ever made. And I think everyone of a certain age probably in this room feels the same way, so thank you. I don't know what we'd think about movies if it wasn't for you, honestly. Um, so I have one question for Tony. 
And then uh, two for Wes. So first question for Tony is, uh, how much of Wes's films did you know or appreciate before you were cast? Um, and because I think, you know, it's been pretty much your lifetime probably that these have been around. And uh, then for Wes, sorry, I'm just, I have to do this. So two questions. Uh, one is, you're moving backwards in time, it seems like, a little bit. Like, you originally started with ambiguous time periods. You moved to the 60s and Moonrise Kingdom, and now you're in the 30s. And I'm curious if you start as a story writer and as a creative person with the decade now, or with these two past movies, or if the decade, you know, came after. And then number two, and please forgive me for this, uh, are we to expect a major female protagonist any time in the near future? So those are, those are my two. <laughs> you write such great, fascinating female characters, so had to ask, so... Thank you for humoring me, everyone. Um, so definitely I'd been a fan of West before any of this process got started. I'd seen the Darjeeling Limited, Fantastic Mr. Fox and the Royal Tenenbaums and I'd loved them all, uh, especially the Darjeeling Limited as I have two brothers and I feel very attached to that movie. And it was just very exciting to be even just auditioning for you know this genius. So I was very fortunate. Thank you. Um, uh, and, um, and yes, and my um, ones, um, the, um, the, what was the first one? Time periods. Um, the time periods thing, uh, um, well, with this movie, uh, we, we, we wrote the, the, the beginning of the story um, many, six years ago or so, we'd written just a, a, a sort of a sketch of the, of the, that's, it's, it's scenes that are in the movie, but it was, they were just on their own, and it, and it was set in the present. Um, so we actually started it thinking it was set today. And then it was when I, it was this writer, Stefan Zweig, that I mentioned, it was when I started thinking I would like to connect it to, to I, that, that it would be a sort of about Europe uh, in his time and that it might express something, uh, that, it might, uh, that we might express some of his ideas in the movie. Um, and that's what put it in that time frame. And, um, but I do, I, I do, but, you know, I, that, that I do have a sort of feeling like I'm, uh, I'm kind of am in a mode to, to do sort of period picture type of things, um, which I don't know why. I mean, Rafe did a wonderful uh, period picture. I mean, his film, The Invisible Woman, about Charles Dickens, is a wonderful um, uh, period picture, which I, I responded to very um, strongly. I love that movie. Um, and then... Um, and it has a female protagonist. And it has a female protagonist, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, which brings us to the other question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, and um, I do. Yeah, I. You know, I. It, it's. It, it's. Uh, this could be uh, one of my. Um, uh, we. Are, you know, I do think Moonrise Kingdom. That one. Um, thank you. Um, that one. Um, I, 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 I. I. sort of feel like the. It, for me, the the lead character in that one was the girl in the story, but. I, w I would like to. What I would love to write uh, uh, um, uh, a part, uh, a, a, a good big part. I, I would like to have the lead character that was a woman. I mean, that's something I've thought about that I want to do. Uh, to see if I can do uh, do that well, um, because I, you know, so, uh, to different degrees. I mean, a, a lot of these movies are kind of. Uh, they're. I mean, this one, it's you know, there's really there are not very many female characters at all. Um, up there, there's a lot of male energy um, in it, and uh, you know, which can be good or bad, you know. You know. Um, but I think it's good advice to try to change this. Hello, all. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. My name is Leanne, and Wes, I had a question for you. We kind of touched on it with the pins and the thick material that you chose for the costume. Do you ever write a part or a scene for a prop or a piece of wardrobe? Does the prosthetic finger ever come before the Margot Tenenbaum? Well, you know, I, I would say not really. You know, you, usually, I, I think most of the characters in these things are, are, are they're, there's usually some person that it's based on some, and something that happened somewhere along the way that's sort of the the, the reason to bother. So some sort of lingering emotion or memory or something like that. Um, I, I feel like they start with relationships. Um, 
but I love a good prop, uh, and um, you know, I, um, I, 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 on this, uh, we, we've worked with a prop master, Sandy Hamilton, on many movies who couldn't do this one. We had a new one, Robin Miller, on this, who was a wonderful collaborator. And you know, in this movie, he had, there are all kinds of, um, you know, there, there's these pastries that uh, they have in the film, which this local baker in this uh, town of Gerlitz, we found she made these for, she made us thousands and thousands of these things that are in the movie. And there was someone who made porcelain, who was a local person. And anyway, uh, uh, say again? The perfume bottle, the perfume bottle was made, that, that, and uh, yes. It, 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 it's a, it's, um, it, the, the prop person is sort of someone who brings in crafts craftspeople and and all and in, in in this case local artists um, and they all became our kind of um, collaborators and some of them appear in the movie and it, it introduces another layer of you know, I mean in a way I'm bringing it back to the to people because the uh, those objects and things are usually connected to the people and they represent the people and they come from these people um, but um, but it was very. It was a fun part of, of making the movie. Was 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 living in this city of Gerlitz and kind of uh, you know occupying the place and uh, being joined by these people. You know, we had we lived in this hotel together, um, all of us. And um, and the uh, the guy who owned the hotel, Georg, and he and um, he was in the fr at the at front desk. But he was also the front desk in the movie. You know, we had cast him in the movie, so we would see him in one outfit at the front desk, and then we would go home, and he would already be there in his other outfit, waiting at the other desk, and he would always get around us and, you know, be there. Um, but um, anyway, it was nice just being a part of this community. That's the end of it. Wes, Rafe, Tony, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you all for coming.